Hello, everybody. Welcome to the C2C podcast, the Classroom to Community podcast. I'm Jeremiah Nicholson. I'm the manager of content creation here at LCMC. And today I have with me Chris Morphew. Um, Chris, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. So as Jeremiah said, I'm Chris Morphew. Um, I'm the assistant director of development, um, but I have my hands kind of in different pots, including schedule creation, um, do some working with students, some grant management, um, getting funds for the program and things like that. Yeah, Chris keeps everything running around here with the grant management, but I don't let Jeremiah fool you. <laughs> well, we all we all do our part here. Last episode, I I know I mentioned that everyone wears a lot of hats, and I that that remains true. Um, but so, Chris, uh, we talked a little bit earlier, and you said you wanted to discuss today some of your uh, background with language teaching and acquisition. Um, so, can you just tell me a little bit about that about yourself? Um, well. Tell the audience, too. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so some background on me. Um, when I finally settled at the University of North Texas um, in, in Denton, Texas, a great place, um, I found myself super interested. I, I realized I had a huge love for languages, um, all of them in general. Obviously, I'm, um, I'm, a, I'm a first language English speaker, so that was something that I've always been picking apart, um, but I would often meet and work with people from different countries. I worked at a timeshare resort and we would have folks come in from Brazil and do some work with us. And so I'm always asking them questions about Portuguese and like, how do you say this? And how do you say that? And what does it mean exactly? You know, and then another crew would come in. We had some groups from Ukraine, same questions like, how do you say this and that? And that was always really intriguing. And then, so when I did get to University of North Texas, um, they had a degree. Um, it was a, it was a specialization at the time. It wasn't a full degree, but in linguistics. And so I jumped into classes. Um, and just kind of really fell in love with how language works in the brain. So kind of breaking down processes across all languages um, and then being very specific with the languages that I studied, which were Spanish at first. Um, and then I did a minor in Italian around that same time. Um, I did a year of French or so. And then a number of years later, once I was finally in Maryland, I took a couple of years of Russian, which I know that we share um, as an as an interest that's right, yeah. And that was, um, you know, back in, in middle school, I started taking Russian classes, and that really opened my eyes to just how much English I didn't know. Um, you know, even as I went on to high school and college, um, you know, as a native speaker, there's a lot of, you know, grammatical rules, and, you know, I'm sure we could talk for an hour about language on the podcast easily. Right, right. Um, but it, it kind of really opened my eyes, and it, it's, like, super cool. I think it's awesome. Um, and you you and I both have the luxury of being you know, English is our first language, and also living in a world where English is a very common language. If you think about um, a lot of things, you know, air traffic controllers, that's the universal language for, for moving planes around the sky is English. Um, and with that in mind, I wanted to ask, um, you know, in your interactions with a lot of people, either here at LCMC or, mm -hmm. you know, earlier, like you said, um, people from Brazil, uh, so we live in a world where a lot of people speak English, but there's always language barriers. And have you had any really super successful methods for overcoming language barriers when you come up against them? So I think when I kind of hear this question, I, I kind of think in two two chunks of an answer, um, one of which is kind of like with myself as I've learned languages, but then obviously with uh, student populations that I've worked with in my um, ESL career. Um, so I think <clears throat> what I would try to, how I connect those is the things that I would do for myself to learn a language. I would try to simplify where necessary um, and you know, impart them with students um, or people trying to learn any language. Um, I think, so like overcoming barriers is, I think to me is kind of parsing apart the problem first. Um, so what is, the, what is the barrier? What is the issue that it's caused by? What are the moving parts with that? And then how do I isolate each one and break it apart and figure out a solution. And then those solutions kind of compound and then you have an answer, like a bigger answer where you've broken it apart from smaller pieces. So like, since we kind of talked a little bit about Russian, um, you've got this, you know, wild looking Russian sentence that has, you know, a bunch of different case markers at the end of words. And, you know, for English, it's, you know, it's an order language. So it's, you know, 98% of the time it's subject, object, verb, mm -hmm. or excuse me, subject, verb, object. Um, whereas Russian is kind of a free word order and they, you know, these markers tell you what things, what job things do in the sentence. So, you know, you look at the sentence and it's like, okay, well, I assume that the first word might be the subject, um, but then wait, no, that's a verb. What's going on here? So, you know, the first thing I would say to find barriers is to look for the pattern, right? What's going on here? Okay, so if I can use those case markers to say, okay, I know that's a verb. 
I've already kind of helped solve that problem and break that barrier down, right? So then if I'm thinking about teaching English um, with students, I might then tell them that same thing. Give them some kind of a structure, some kind of a pattern to look for first, and then give them some solutions to how to understand um, that order, right? So telling them like subjects come first, verbs are usually in the middle, objects, and then we just pretend adverbs don't exist for a real long time, right? <laughs> so give students that kind of general structure and then say, now that we know that, let's look at the individual pieces and see what they're doing and how they interact with each other. That's awesome. kind of a microcosm. Um, I, I can go on if you'd like. No, uh, absolutely. <laughs> and and I, like I said before, we could spend an hour talking about this and I know, you know, no, no one experience is universal, but that, that was very good. Thank you. Right, thanks. Um, and that's something, you know, so I, again, you know, I, I did Russian throughout um, middle school, high school, and college. And, you know, middle school is pretty young. Um, and one of the things I realized, you know, much later in life after college, I, I wanted to pick up another language. Um, so just on Duolingo, you know, I, I know it's not ideal, but I started looking at German. And what I found myself doing is, you know, sort of like someone who's, learned a language natively or at a very young age, it would, Duolingo would be asking me a question about German and the, the Russian answer would pop into my head. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to ask you, you know, and here at LCMC, we do adult education, right? Um, and a lot of our, our coworkers' backgrounds are purely in adult education. And I wanted to ask if there's any, you know, unique challenges you faced in adult ed that might not be present in, you know, more traditional K through 12 type learning. Yes, I think in some ways it's hard for me to answer because I don't have much of a background in K-12, but I think, you know, like I do have a kid. He's not quite K-12. He's just two years old, two and a half now. But, um, you know, my wife works in education and I've known lots of other educators and I did come up through the K-12 system. So I, I, that's not doesn't make me an expert, obviously, but I can kind of try to apply some things that I think I see. Um, I think... <clears throat> Wow, challenges is kind of kind of the opposite word that I think of. I think, <laughs> and maybe that's why I chose adult ed. Um, but I think, if I can speak to that for a second, I think adult ed for me feels easier to facilitate in some ways. Um, and now that I'm thinking about that, I have a challenge that I'll come back to in just a second. Let's put an asterisk there. But I think with adults, you know, they kind of have um, theoretically they've already got these kind of critical thinking skills and these abilities to parse out patterns. Whereas with kids, I think you're kind of building those patterns up, you know, where you're teaching them how to think and teach them how to problem solve. But when you get adults in the classroom, I would say more generally speaking, they, they kind of have those skills down. Um, so you can just kind of jump into the analysis part um, as opposed to what I, what I would say with kids, you, you have to kind of build how to analyze first and then apply those same principles. Uh, that's you know, a very broad stroke. Um, but I, I, I would say that applies, but there's another side to that coin and it's that if they already have certain skills developed and they're not going to be applied in the same way in a language classroom, you kind of have to break some of those down, rebuild them to analyze like a language structure. I'll give you an example. So since we're kind of on Russian this morning, if, um, if you have a Russian speaker who's wanting to learn English and they're starting from a lower level, you know, they have an understanding of what word order is in Russian and it's free, right? It's we're mm -hmm. marking things with cases and, um, things can go wherever they go, <laughs> wherever I feel like at the moment, whatever topic I want to focus on. But English, we said, isn't that way. So then having to teach them that there is a strict word or, and having to kind of, I guess we could say like break old habits, right. Um, to get them to put subjects first or to get objects to go at towards the end of the sentence. Um, you do have to rebuild that. So that I think breaking old patterns can be a challenge. Um, you know, but I think, maybe as a linguist, I'm, I'm a bit more descriptive with things as opposed to prescriptive. So I think that's kind of part of the fun of it, right? So we're describing these patterns and we kind of get to, get to have a good time looking at them and like rebuilding those things. And there's opportunity there for learning. And so I think keeping the pressure off doesn't necessarily make it a challenge um, in a negative way, but in Absolutely. kind of an exciting way. Um, I think that's, that's a, the biggest challenge that comes to mind immediately. Okay. All right. Yeah. That was very insightful. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I, Touched on this a little bit. Um, you you have your past in in education, um, but to get a bit more specific, how has working at LCMC been different from other organizations that you've been with in the past? I'm giving a little head shake to Jeremiah because it's completely different. <laughs> um, <laughs> I come from an, like an academia background, um, so I was at the University of North Texas, graduated from there with a bachelor's and then a master's, and then I immediately started working there. Um, they have a full-time intensive English program for F1 students. So those would be um, 
uh, students on a student visa specifically. They can do nothing else but go to school. Um, so the course content was super rigorous. The curriculum was, you know, funded and built out through the university. It was just this like really tight knit, rigorous program. Um, very high expectations. If you didn't meet them, you know, you're, you're out. Um, very specific about the student populations it would be working with and selecting to be there. Um, and then after I moved to Maryland, I worked at a community college. Um, and that had a lot of similarities. It's still a college, right? It's in, you know, the community college, university type system. Um, and that particular program was kind of a weird amalgamation of this intensive English side, but then also this um, Department of Labor funded program. So in some way similar to us, um, you know, so that there was a lot of variety, but overall the structure was still fairly rigid. We had these classes that students fit into, and if they didn't, then, you know, in some ways they, we can try out in other programs that we have at that program. But then again, if they don't, then maybe it's not right for you and you can check something else out. So there were these kind of um, boundaries in a lot of ways. Um, and that's not just with students, but also with policies, procedures, how the program would operate, um, just kind of all around. I think the university and college systems are kind of marked by boundaries um, and silos in some cases. But, I mean, you know, and if anyone out there listening is familiar with CBOs, like nonprofits, <laughs> the boundaries, we get to we get to pivot quickly. We get to change directions. We get to do things where a lot of those boundaries um, are, and we just jump right over them. Um, I think kind of relating to what I was saying before, you know, those can appear as challenges because this, like, open open world of what we want to do um, – looks really daunting and, and and it is at times right but then there's also that excitement of jumping into these things you know where we see a need that students or that communities might have hey we don't do that but can we analyze what we can do and how we can help exactly what i was saying before right analyze the problem what are some solutions and jump into that community and help where we can um so i think that's the biggest difference is the ability to pivot very quickly right um and we're also super chill here too that's a that's a nice change from, course, from like the university system yeah, and that's something uh, in in the episode with Ruth. Uh, if you haven't seen it, check it out. Um, but you know, I, I praised LCMC's flexibility, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I don't come from an education background, really. I come from a production, you know, video and audio background, aside from from my own personal language learning. Um, but that was something you know, I, I recognized immediately because it's not, you know, as you described, you know, a lot of other systems are fairly rigid, mm -hmm. but just seeing the the willingness and openness of people you know if someone shows up at the door uh and they they have a need right even if we don't have an exact program for that or even if the person in the office isn't the exact right person to talk to everyone is is more than willing to help out people in a very direct way and i think that's it's just a super great environment to be in for sure for sure yeah uh all right and we got one more um i'm just spitballing here uh but last week we talked with Ruth about goals and the importance of goal setting. Mm -hmm. And I, I asked her a similar question, but could you tell me about a time, a lesson plan or a similar classroom event sort of situation didn't go as expected? Yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> do you want me to lean more into the tragically didn't go as planned or like the, you know, the the one that you can spin in the moment? Um, well, we could, we could we can keep it light, but honestly, whatever you want. Sure. And I, when I say tragic there, I just mean like where the plan just kind of falls apart and things yeah, fall. Yeah, no, no, no. you know, that's nothing. We don't live in a perfect world, right? Well, but, but to that, I think that happens, right? Yeah. Like um, perhaps newer teachers, when they first start setting up lesson plans, they first start getting in the classrooms, they might have these expectations that things are going to go exactly as planned. Um, and then from there, they can kind of grab hold on which of kind of these two big uh, ways of thinking, ways of doing things. One is it's like strangling, in my opinion, strangling a lesson plan and trying to force it to go exactly the way that mm -hmm. you've planned it. This is going to take 15 minutes and 20 minutes. Or, you know, and I lean into this one as a descriptive linguist, right? Like, here are some light plans. Here is some content that we're going to cover. Here are, you know, here are the things we're going to go for. But, you know, the wind might take us a different direction, right? Students might really need to latch on to something else that we've got in the lesson. And, that's where their needs are, so let's go there. Um, so trying to pick a specific example, I think, of a time when a lesson plan doesn't go as planned, 
is hard because I kind of toss things all together, right? Yeah, things don't yeah. go according to plan frequently, um, not in a negative way, but just in a, hey, we're going to adjust course in the moment, right? If, Absolutely. If we're doing a discussion activity on a vocabulary set about um, grocery shopping or going to stores, even make it a little bit more general, you know, and students really start poking and asking questions about a set of vocabulary inside of that, like tech vocabulary, if you go to a Best Buy or something like that, mm -hmm. then we're going to go there, right? Um, now, I will say, you know, as a little bit of a thing to keep in mind, that doesn't necessarily mean that teachers should just go willy-nilly 24-7, right? Absolutely. Like yeah. having plans, having having goals, which I, you know, you and Ruth talked about, um, having kind of these general ideas about where your course is going, right? Mm -hmm. And I think general is kind of a dicey word there, but knowing where the class is going overall is very important, right? And then putting those plans in place, but then ebbing and flowing where where you need to, right? But that happens. Like that's just just what it is to teach. You know, you might prepare um, seven stations because you have fourteen students on your roster. Well, two students are absent. Are you still going to force that seventh station? No, you're going to get rid of one of them. You know, or or if you have an even number on your roster and you have an uneven number of students in class that day, which happens every class, right? Where you know you planned for yep. x yep. number of groups, and that's just not going to be the number of groups. But it happens. It happens all the time. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Again, thank you, Chris, so much. It's lovely talking with you. Sure, for sure. Um, everybody out there, be sure to tune in next week. We'll have another episode hot off the presses for you. Once again, I'm Jeremiah Nicholson, and this is the C2C Podcast. Thanks, Jeremiah, for having me. Thank you. Thank you.